1966 to 1970 was one of the most creative periods in cover design in the history of the vinyl album. And at the forefront of this revolution was, of course, the Beatles. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and welcome to part two of this look at the Beatles UK album covers. Got any ideas for our new album cover? John asked his old mate Klaus Vormann when he telephoned him towards the end of the recording sessions for Revolver in June 1966. He hadn't, but after hearing some of the already completed tracks at Abbey Road, he set to work at his kitchen table in his tiny attic apartment in Hampstead, London, with scissors, scalpel, glue and his drawing pen. Three weeks and a lot of hard work later, the album cover as we know it today was done. Brian Epstein thought it was an inspired piece of work, but despite his promises, couldn't get more than a paltry £50 out of EMI for Klaus's artwork, which incidentally is owned today by Ringo's great mate, guitarist Joe Walsh. Printing duties were initially shared by Ernest J. Day and Garrod and Lofthouse, with Garrod and Lofthouse taking over after the initial run. Aside from the mono and stereo formats, there are no printing variations of this cover, but the hardest to find are the Ernest J. Day stereos, of which I've only seen a handful over the years. With no new Beatles songs available for the all-important Christmas season in 1966, EMI put together a collection of Beatles oldies. This, their first compilation album, rounded up all the hits and best bits up to that point throwing in Bad Boy, which at the time was unreleased in the UK, as a kind of bonus track for fans who already had everything else. Another unique aspect of this album was it was the first Beatles album not to feature the group on the front cover. Instead, you got this garish illustration by British artist David Christian, who had been commissioned by Brian Epstein. Christian, I think, was a rather odd choice, since Lennon himself had been impressed by and had expressed admiration for the work of the most talented pop art illustrator of the day, Alan Aldridge, who I think, given his amazing work on the Beatles' illustrated lyrics later on, would have done a much better job. For this release, Garrett and Lofthouse printed all the mono covers and shared the stereo ones with Ernest J. Day. Aside from the obvious difference in flipback credits, the front stereo indicator on Ernest J. Day covers is placed in the stars actually on the cover art, whereas the Garrett and Lofthouse sleeves have it confined to the white border. The only other variation I've come across of this cover is this alternate stereo information box on an early Garrett and Lofthouse example. The photo of the group on the rear panel in their hotel room in Japan is actually reversed. In Japan, it was noticed that the Japanese characters on Paul's kimono were backwards, so it appears the correct way round on covers issued there. Garrett and Lofthouse also printed this special display cover with a modified rear panel, which left you in no doubt who this album was by. So much has already been written about the Sgt Pepper's cover, so I'll just talk about some of the lesser known aspects and variations of it here. After getting away with relatively low design costs for the last two album covers, EMI knew they had to bend a little towards the Beatles' demands for this one. The Beatles had originally wanted the album to come with sweets, colouring pencils and badges, but this was clearly out of the question. In the end, a compromise was reached, and the album ended up in a deluxe, fully laminated gatefold cover, which contained an illustrated cutout sheet and a red and white inner sleeve designed by the Dutch design team, The Fool. Garrett and Lofthouse were the only company involved in printing covers for this album, and it was their biggest challenge yet. You can tell how tight things must have been, because the first covers to hit the shops were printed up from proof covers. The evidence of this can be seen on early mono examples, which have the word fourth proof printed on the right flip over inside the gatefold. Despite the badges and pencils idea being dropped, some early covers were made with 8mm square, or wide spines, in both mono and stereo, which might have been a prototype design to house the extra items. These were produced for a very short time before the thinner spines became the norm. In 1969, as mono was dying out, a cover was designed to house both mono and stereo discs. This was achieved by printing both the mono and stereo catalogue number on the cover's rear panel. 
Discs usually found inside these covers are the one EMI box parlophone pressings. 1969 covers can also be identified by their wider inner flipovers, which carried some of the colour of the outer panel inside. Although not issued as a full 12 inch album in the UK, the Magical Mystery Tour double EP set was certainly as expensive to produce and way more complicated than anything attempted by a pop group on that format before. As with the film, it was Paul who took control of the record and the idea to make it into a double EP set was his. The Christmas market was, as you know, the most important time for record companies and the pressure to get product out on time was immense. Looking back at the production schedule for some of these covers, it's amazing how quickly everything came together and what, given the huge advance orders, was achieved in such a short space of time. The release date for this EP was set at December the 13th, but it was October until any thought was given to the cover art and design. One of the main ideas was to include a colourful picture booklet inside the cover, which would contain a comic strip version of the film. The man tasked with drawing the strip was Bob Gibson, whose work would have been familiar to Beatles fans already, as he'd been drawing cartoons in the Beatles monthly magazine since 1963. Despite being advertised as containing a 32-page booklet, it was a 28-page version that eventually emerged, which along with Bob Gibson's comic strip also contained some memorable photographs by John Kelly, a few of which were taken from scenes missing from the final film. The double EP set went on sale for 19 shillings and sixpence, which in today's money works out at about £18, or $25. Like the Sgt Pepper cover, it was printed solely by Garrett and Lofthouse, and it was a beautiful work of art. The high gloss laminated outer panels opened up to reveal pockets inside, into which slotted the discs, which themselves were contained within plain white die cut inner sleeves with fluted top edges. The centre of the booklet contained a blue lyric sheet, which changed colour in the later 70s and 80s pressings to yellow, green and light purple. Last year, we were lucky enough to find this original Garrett and Lofthouse made EMI factory box containing 20 pristine uncirculated copies of the UK first stereo pressing. They'd lain for many years in a shop in Sweden, who back in 1967 imported nearly all of their copies from the UK. You can watch us unboxing those for the first time in one of our other videos on the channel. Richard Hamilton's inspired design for the White Album took album cover design to new heights, as well as becoming the most challenging album cover EMI and Garrett and Lofthouse had undertaken to date. Unlike the Sgt Pepper cover with its host of celebrities and hidden messages, there was only one major thing to focus on on the White Album, and that of course was its unique front cover number. EMI's initial reaction when asked to do the numbering was, can't do it, but somehow Garrett and Lofthouse came up with a machine and a system which actually worked. There's much legend and debate about the first four, but it's widely accepted that they went to the Beatles. Paul has said in the past that John got number one because he shouted the loudest, but it was actually Ringo who ended up with it. He then sold it along with a lot of his other memorabilia at auction in 2015, where it went for $790,000. What exactly happened to the other three is not entirely clear. However, as you can see from this photo, number three is definitely still out there. The closest I've come to those first four copies is number five, which we sold on behalf of a collector back in November 2008 for £19,200 or $26,000. Unfortunately, the true origin of that copy has been lost in time. Another low numbered copy we handled back in 2014 was number 18. This was a very interesting example because aside from it having a very low number, it had been, as you can hopefully see from these pictures, put together sort of inside out and back to front. All of the first top opening numbered covers housed mono discs, designated stereo covers, which had a small stereo indicator in the upper right corner of the rear panel began at 300,000 and ended at 599,999. However, the numbering continued into the 600,000 range as mono covers, with this example being one of the final top opening numbered covers. The numbering restarted again in 1970, but by then they'd switched to side opening covers with six digit numbers, 
beginning at 100,000, eventually stopping altogether in the mid-70s at around 150,000, despite strict instructions from the Beatles themselves that every single White Album ever produced would be numbered. All first pressing copies originally came with a familiar poster and four portrait photos, which were protected by a single small white sheet of paper which was placed over the top. The black inner sleeves may have looked arty, but their rough matte finish were not kind to the discs playing surfaces. They were used on other Apple albums too, including the next Beatles release, Yellow Submarine. Held back until January 1969 so as not to harm sales of the White Album, the regular tri flip back cover returned for one last time for this album. Both early mono and stereo covers can be identified by their thicker cardstock, on which the front panel always yellowed slightly. This can be seen more clearly on the back, where the laminated flipbacks meet the unlaminated rear panel. These were soon replaced by covers with a thinner, whiter cardstock, to which the printer's name and patent numbers were added to the rear flipback. Early covers also had red horizontal lines above and below the text, which was changed to grey on later non-flipback issues. By the time Abbey Road was issued, flipbacks had gone from most EMI albums. The cover was as simple as you could get, it was just a folded sheet of laminated card. The earliest covers were different to ones which appeared a few weeks after release. Firstly, they had a slightly zoomed in front panel image, which is most noticeable in the upper right corner, where there's less sky above the top of the building. There's also a little less of one of the white stripes of the zebra crossing in front of John. The rear panel was different too. As well as having less space to the left of the Abbey Road sign, the Apple logo was also positioned further to the left or misaligned beneath the side one track listing. It was quickly reset so that on later copies, the Apple symbol sat squarely under the song titles. Early copies only came with black inner sleeves, which had first been used on the White Album. The most expensive and elaborate cover design was saved for last. I say album cover, but Let It Be was issued first as a deluxe box set only on May the 8th, 1970. The cost of which was a whopping two pounds nineteen shillings and eleven pence, which in today's money is fifty pounds or nearly seventy dollars. The set's official catalogue number was PXS1, although that number didn't appear anywhere printed on the set. It was for ordering purposes only. This beautiful but extremely fragile multi-component set was designed by John Kosh and comprised a laminated slipcase which housed an outer tray with square or rounded flaps, in which sat a folded inner tray designed to hold the book. The actual vinyl album was placed over that. The 11 by 8 inch 164 page softback book contained many superb black and white and colour stills by Ethan A. Russell, along with transcripts of dialogue from the sessions and additional text by Jonathan Cott and David Dalton. Early books omitted the credits on page 7, but had them printed onto a small strip of paper which was then pasted in. As great as the book was, it had one major fault, its binding. In an effort to keep costs down, the book was perfect bound, which meant that the pages were glued to the spine. Books bound this way today are done so using a flexible PUR adhesive, but back in 1970, Garrett and Lofthouse used a hot melt glue which once cooled became very brittle. So after opening the book a couple of times, the glue in the spine would crack and the pages would become loose and fall out. Most of the albums which came with these sets had red apple logos on their rear panels, but some came with green apples at a ratio of around three red to one green. Some sets also came with a small folded apple poster showing the label's album catalogue up to mid-1969. These posters are not found in all sets and may have been added at point of sale. They can also be found in various other 1969 one EMI box pressings of other Beatles albums sold at the time. Researching the covers for these videos has made me realise how many stories there are about every one of them, let alone all of the international variations which exist of each. 
so I hope to be able to cover each one individually in more detail in the future. But I really hope you enjoyed this overview of the UK covers and maybe learned something you didn't know along the way. There's lots more videos lined up on even more fascinating subjects, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on those. In the meantime, please check out our website, parlogramauctions.com, as well as our Facebook and Instagram pages. Or better still, why not help me keep all of this going by becoming a channel member? But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.